Hi everyone, uh, good to see you again. And I'm James and I'll be conducting this 30 minutes webinar starting now. Hope you are doing well. Happy New Year. And thank you for attending the webinar tonight. Welcome to Talk Stocks with James series, Why Coca-Cola Holds a Sweet Spot in Warren Buffett's Portfolio. Our webinar is conducted every alternate Thursday, 7.30 p.m. The next one will be January 19, followed by 2nd February. And previously, a lot of audience has been asking us to upload the recording. And yes, we are uploading our webinar on our YouTube channel, starting from the last webinar itself. And this webinar is also live on YouTube. And replay will be available on YouTube as well. So look out for that. We will also email you the link to the recording. And let me begin uh, with some disclaimer first. This presentation is for education and sharing purpose only and does not constitute to any form of advice. Past performance is not indicative of any future performance. You are responsible for your own investment. And a little bit about myself, I'm James, market strategist at U Smart Securities. I'm also a SGS Academy speaker. Um, basically, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is look at the financial market and give market commentary. Uh, this is me appearing on some medias, and this is me again presenting during some webinar or seminar. Okay, today I will share US market outlook and why Warren Buffett has been holding Coca-Cola stock since 1988. And with recession looming, how resilient is Coca-Cola? And currently, U Smart Security would also like to reward new customers who listen to this webinar with US, uh, uh, two US dollars. So if you are still a new customer and have not yet deposited money in your trading account, please type in your U Smart account number in the Q&A box. I will then provide your account number to my bad end to verify and we will transfer you the cash voucher. If you cannot remember your USMART ID, it's okay. You can also provide me your email or handphone number in the Q&A box in this Zoom webinar. What you type in the Zoom Q&A box will not be shown to others, so do not need to worry about that. Okay, without further ado, let's look at the performance map. This is the performance for various asset classes over the past 10 years. We could see that STI returned 8.36% in 2022, outperforming many other asset classes and equity indices. For example, gold being the traditional safe haven asset class provide a negative 0.77% uh, in 2022. S&P 500 returned negative 18%, Europe equity was negative 16%, China equity uh, is the worst performing with negative 22% in 2022. Couple of key highlights here. Number one, I think the reason for STI outperformance in 2022 is because it is a defensive asset allocation in the eyes of many fund managers. My theory is if the world goes into a recession in 2023, STI may continue to outperform many other equity indices because STI is a risk of asset allocations. Asset allocation. Number two, I believe a lot of Singapore investors are disappointed with US stock market and may want to reallocate some of the USD back to Singapore stocks. I don't quite agree with that. I think investors should only invest more in Singapore stocks if they cannot take the volatility in US stocks or they are predicting an economic hard landing in US or they are super good with market timing. Because I just like to stress that in longer term, US equity usually outperforms Singapore stock market. For example, even though S&P 500 underperformed Singapore stocks by 26% uh, last year, 
uh, based on analyzed return, we could see that US stocks outperform in three years, five year, 10 year, and 15 years basis. For example, if you invest in US in 2008 and not doing anything with your portfolio, your return would be 250% 15 years later. But for the same period, your return in investing in SDI index is only 56%. So all in all, don't lose faith in US stocks just yet. Number three, if you are a bond investor, you will have noticed that global high yield fell 12% in 2022 and global investment grade fell 16% in 2022. This is quite surprising because over the past 10 years, we never witnessed this kind of negative yearly return in bond market. In the past, the drop in IG wasn't severe. For example, IG provide a third negative 2.6% return in 2013, three point, uh, negative 3% 3 in 2018, and negative 4% in 2021. So bond really lost his shine in 2022. Uh, and this is quite serious uh, in many perspectives. Number one, 60% of the world asset is in bond. So suffice to say, many global funds lost money in 2022. Number two, traditionally, if you are a risk adverse investor, your financial advisor would have asked you to adopt a less risky portfolio by asking you to take more bond holdings as opposed to equity. But in 2022, this kind of strategy doesn't work. Number three, a traditional wisdom is 60-40 portfolio usually will help you generate good diversified return. What is 60-40 portfolio? In a 60-40 portfolio, you invest 60% of your assets in equities and the other 40% in bond. But in 2022, if you invest 60% in S&P 500 ETF and 40% in global IG, you will have generate a, a negative 17% return. So after all, I think bond will have a brighter year in 2023. But consider this, looking at longer term, like 10-year annualized return, high U is... 2.99% uh, positive return and IG is negative 0.44%. So that begs the question, is bond risk and reward really better than equity in longer term? Uh, personally, I prefer equity in long term and investor may consider holding more equity instead of bond in the next few years. Or I should say for those balance risk profile investor, like you previously invest 50% in equity and 50% in bond. One of the strategy here is maybe you could take lesser bond holdings, like instead of investing 50% in bond, you may consider invest 30% in bond and the remaining 20% in less volatile sector like utility or consumer staple uh, sector or REITs uh, that pay you dividend or defensive asset class like gold. Because traditionally, investor like bond due to the low correlation or negative correlation to equity. We could see that from 60-day correlation between global IG and global equity most of the time, or from 2014 to 2021, the theory here is negative correlation is true but not so in 2021 and 2022. This explains why 6040 portfolio did not deliver on client expectation in 2022. And this is why I think investors should consider lesser bond and consider or consider alternative to bond itself. And if less volatile equity sector or gold 
are really out of the questions and you still want bond equivalents, you may consider cash or those very short duration bond itself. Uh, next, I'd like to talk about high yield quickly. The idea here is bond market usually leads stock market because bond traders usually knows the market better than stock trader. This shows you the performance of high yield and S&P 500. The key takes away here is stocks and high yield usually move in line. Meaning to say when high yield goes up, US stocks also goes up and vice versa. Uh, for example, high yield dropped 11% last year and S&P 500 went down as well. But sometimes this positive correlation doesn't work. Uh, since uh, 1989, there are three separate occasions uh, high yield and S&P 500 have negative correlation. Uh, those years are 1994, 2001, and 2015. So the, key, so the first key takeaway is if you reckon high yield will go up next year, uh, S&P usually will follow. The second key takeaway is since 1989, US high yield has never recorded two consecutive periods of negative annual returns. Meaning to say, since high yield has a negative return last year, then this year, high yield is likely to provide you a positive return. Thirdly, since 1990, the S&P 500 has generated a positive return 86% of the time in the year after high yield delivers negative return. Uh, and on average, S&P 500 next year return is positive 22%. So considering S&P 500 closed 3839 at the end of 2022, in 2023, S&P 500 may end the year at 4683 if the history repeats itself. I know this 22% return sounds absurd, but I'm looking forward for a positive 2023 at least because it's extremely rare for the S&P 500 to post back-to-back -back losing year itself. Since 1930, there are only eight occasions that S&P 500 posts two negative down years. Most of the times, S&P 500 rebounds strongly after a down year. Okay. And next, let's talk about Coca-Cola. The main reason why I want to talk about Coca-Cola is because I have covered a lot of technology stocks in the past seminars. So it's good to talk about something else, other sectors like consumer staple. The second reason I think uh, is because I think this is one of the most overlooked stocks by many investors. As we can see from the analyst recommendation consensus in Bloomberg, currently 20 analysts recommend buy, 8 recommend hold on Coca-Cola. But the upside potential is just uh, 5%. So I think many investors will reckon that upside does not seem exciting and they can completely exclude Coca-Cola in their portfolio. To them, this is not the shiny, growing technology company. It is a boring company. But still, Seasoned investors such as Warren Buffett has uh, uh, likes Coca-Cola a lot and I reckon he's not selling anytime soon. And let me share with you why you may consider Coca-Cola in your portfolio as well. So Coca-Cola was founded in 1886. So it has been in existence for more than 130 years. It was listed on New York Stock Exchange in 1919. And I think probably investors think they know the company too well and there's, there is nothing Coca-Cola can bring to their portfolio. But still, Warren Buffett has been investing Coca-Cola since 1988. It's now uh, Warren Buffett's fourth largest uh, holding account for 
7.6% in Warren Buffett portfolio. And it is also the longest held stock in Berkshire's portfolio. Very quickly on his investment timeline, Warren Buffett first bought 23 million shares in 1988. And by 1994, he had accumulated 100 million shares. And since then, he has not been adding to his position. You may ask why in the latest 13F statement shows that he has 400 million shares now. It is because Coca-Cola has two for one stock split in 1996 and 2012. So this explains how 100 million shares become 400 million. And it accounts for lesser and lesser weights in his portfolio. For example, it accounts for 16% in 2014, and now it only accounts for 7.6% of his portfolio. Nevertheless, it's still one of the most important holdings, uh, and it only costs him 1.3 million to acquire Coca-Cola, to own Coca-Cola, is now worth 25 billion. If Warren Buffett were to sell Coca-Cola, he would have gained 19.5 times return, not taking into account the dividend he has gained over the years. So it is quite a good return. So, so what is so good about Coca-Cola and why Coca-Cola is still relevant in your portfolio. Firstly, strong uh, company boats. Uh, Coca-Cola has strong brand name. One of the Warren Buffett's famous quotes is, if you give me 100 billion and say, take away the soft drink leadership of Coca-Cola in the world, I will give it back to you and say it cannot be done. There is not many companies can have strong brand value for more than 130 years, Coca-Cola is one of them. Coca-Cola is one of the most recognized brands in the world. According to Brand Directory, Coca-Cola holds on to number one position in the most valuable soft drinks brand worldwide in 2022. Betsy ranked uh, second, but the brand value is 57% lower than Coca-Cola's brand value. In another report by Interbrands, we could also see that Coca-Cola is also the most valuable beverage brand. Coca-Cola was ranked seventh best global brand as opposed to Betsy, who emerged in 32nd place. Why this is important? Because it shows you that Coca-Cola will likely still be the best soda drinks in the future, regardless how many new and better soda drinks launch in the future. Why do I say so? It's because Coca-Cola has been with us for more than 130 years and people like something that they are familiar with rather than something that is new or better. People will consume Coke simply because of better brand value. Rising health concerns and changing consumer preference have also been bothering Coca-Cola. This is why other than classic Coke, uh, Coca-Cola also come up with Coke Zero and Diet Coke. And Coca-Cola also diversify to other drinks as well. And all these healthier drinks are solely paying off. Currently, Coca-Cola is offering more than 200 brands from soda to water, from coffee to teas to juices to vitamin drinks, and they are available in more than 200 countries. Uh, under the Coca-Cola brand, it owns uh, Sprite, Fanta, Minute Maid, Vitamin Water, Dasani, Seal, Costa Coffee, Georgia Honesty, Simply Power Rate, and many other brands. Coca-Cola also owns 19% stake in Monster Beverage and it has the right to distribute Dr. Pepper brands in US and Canada and also own the right to distribute Dr. Pepper in most parts of 
Europe. In 2021, you can find five Coca-Cola brands in the top 10 best-selling soft drinks in US, namely Coca-Cola, Sprite, Diet Coke, Coke Zero, and Fanta. Pepsi, meanwhile, uh, comes at come in at second place with Pepsi Cola, Mountain Dew, uh, Diet Pepsi under his brand. The third place is Dr. Pepper. And if you look at bigger picture, Coca-Cola has been slowly stealing market share. It has increased from 42% market share in 2004 to 46% in 2021. Pepsi market share, meanwhile, has come down from uh has come down from 30% to 25%. And in terms of global soft drinks industry, Coca-Cola also blew the competition away by owning 38% of the market share. Strong brand name also come with strong pricing power as well. Coca-Cola raised its price by 12% on average in 2022 and still is not seeing demand for soft drinks decline. And the other strong modes is extensive distribution network. And let me go through the business model to explain uh, what is that. Coca-Cola makes money involving two separate divisions. One that sells soda to bottlers and the other one sells its finished products. The concentrated operations basically means selling concentrates, syrup to authorized bottling partner and the bottling partner combine concentrates with water and or sweeteners to produce finished beverage. Uh, the finished beverage are then packaged in authorized containers and, and are then sold to retailers directly. Basically, you can think of this as a franchise model like McDonald's franchise model. As for finished product operations, it sells finished beverage to retailers and distributors and wholesalers as well. Over the years, uh, you can see that Coca-Cola is slowly moving away from bottling business, um, which is the which is the finished product business. This is why concentrate operations has been contributing more and more to the revenue. It was contributing um, to 39% of the revenue in 2011 and in 2021 is contributing uh, 56% to the revenue. And finished operations, on the other hand, now only accounts for 44% of the revenue. Why they are moving away from doing the bottling themselves and instead they work with trusted franchisees? Because the actual process of, cor uh, of converting the syrups to finished products is not profitable. Generally, finished product operations generate a higher operating revenue but lower gross profit margin than the concentrate operations. This is why since Coca-Cola embraces more concentrate operation, we could see that the operating margin uh, actually improved from 21% in 2017 to 26% in 2021. And even though revenue improved by uh, 23% from 2017 to 2021, we can actually see that because of the improvement in the operating margin, the operating income actually increased by 32%. Uh, in terms of the revenue growth itself, I think everyone should not be expecting much from it. The revenue base already grew too big. So personally, I only expect mid-single-digit growth going forward. But since, and since there is not much excitement that you should be expecting from the revenue part, what Coca-Cola can do 
and is doing now is to continue improving the earnings per share. And the next key investment thesis for Coca-Cola is it is a dividend king. Coca-Cola has good track record of paying dividend. 2022 would be the, uh, I think, 59th consecutive annual dividend increases. The stock has been consistently paying quarterly dividend over the years. In 2022, they are paying quarterly dividend of 44 cents. Its current dividend yield is uh, 2.77% and its dividend KGA is 8.1% since 1993. And its free cash flow dividend payout ratio is 64%, which it was uh, 120% in 2017. Basically, it tells you that Coca-Cola free cash flow is growing, that Coca-Cola has lesser stress nowadays paying dividend. All in all, what I'd like to share here is Coca-Cola dividend payout seems sustainable and growing. Lastly, Coca-Cola is a flight to safety investment. Coca-Cola belongs to consumer staple sector that usually has lower volatility. The 20-year analyzed standard deviation is 19 times and S&P 500 is uh, 20 times. Maximum drawdown is negative 42% for Coca-Cola and negative 56% for S&P 500. Single stock usually has higher volatility than indices because indices have more stocks in, into it itself. But in this case, Coca-Cola provides lesser volatility relative to S&P 500. So this is something that I think everyone should appreciate. And in times of distress, it tends to outperform S&P 500. For example, S&P 500 is down 18% and Coca-Cola is up 10% in 2022. In 2018, S&P 500 is down 5%, Coca-Cola is up 7%. But if there are some economic hard landing at like 2008 or 2000, then everything will come down in prices. Nevertheless, if you were to look at five-year analyzed returns, uh, Coca-Cola is positive 10%, S&P 500 is positive 9%, Coca-Cola outperformed S&P 500 in near term itself. So in conclusion, um, I think if you invest in any traditional company, you will be worried about when this industry will be disrupted by technology. But Coca-Cola isn't as risk from the technological changes. Coca-Cola looks likely to survive well and continue to dominate the soft drink market. I think if you are a Norwegian investor and you want something less risky, this could be one of the first few stocks you want to consider. And if you have been only investing in Singapore stocks in the past and want to start investing in US stock market and again, want something less volatile, uh, something like Singapore stocks that, that is typically less volatile, Coca-Cola can probably match your risk profile. Especially if you want a consumer staple other than Shenzhong, Coca-Cola is a consumer stable stock can, that can provide you a better growth story. And if you are a seasoned investor, you probably want to include Coca-Cola in your portfolio to help you cushion your portfolio ups and down. You may ask, is there a better alternative in the US consumer stable sector? The answer is yes. Costco is a better alternative to me. I like Costco more. And this is why I first introduced you to Costco in my previous webinar. I reckon Costco has a better growth story. But you also need to consider that Costco is much more expensive in terms of valuations and more volatile. 
Uh, nevertheless, I think both are good consumer staple company. So why not both? Okay, that's all for me. Uh, and if you are a new investor and have not yet deposited any money to your trading account, please provide you, me your Smart ID in the Zoom and we will deposit uh, two US dollars cash voucher into your trading account. We are also running uh, interest reward promotion as well. If you have some idle cash, you may want to participate in this interest reward promotion to enjoy up to 4.8% per annum interest. The login period is six months. Minimum investment amount to partake is 500 US dollars. Basically, you need to submit your interest in our app uh, before uh, 8 of January. And then our platform uh, will go and register you. So it's very easy to join. You just need to go to your Usmart app, click on the banner on top of your app, and you can find all the information there. Okay, so now I open uh, the Q&A sessions. If you have any question, please uh, ask and I will answer them. Okay, I, I see a question here. Um, why invest in Coca Cola but not Pepsi? Okay, um, couple of reasons for that. Uh, firstly, Coca Cola has a stronger brand name. Uh, than Pepsi, and Coca Cola has a larger market share as well. Secondly, uh, Coca Cola has a better profit margin. I think I have the slides uh, somewhere here. Let me try to find it. Yep, here is it. Okay, Betsy has a better profit margins in terms of gross margin and operating profit margin. So uh, typically I like a company with higher operating margin. Uh, thirdly, Coca-Cola is a total beverage company. Most of its earnings come from beverage business. As for Pepsi, 45% uh, of the revenue come from beverage and the remaining 55% come from food, snacks itself. So uh, it's not a pure beverage company and I probably I don't understand the snack industry enough to like Pepsi. It's like if you uh, want to buy a chip maker, investors tend to invest in TSMC instead of Samsung Electronics because the cheap business account for uh, only 35% of the total revenue of Samsung. So this is why uh, since uh, Coca-Cola is a total beverage company, I think uh, it actually makes uh, it easier to fully understand the business model itself. Okay. Let me see if there's any other questions. Okay, do you think stocks will drop after earning release given the impact of higher interest rates and quantitative tightening? Okay, um, it's a very good question. Uh, I would say that the higher interest rates will definitely hurt the earnings. But we also need to understand that uh, because of this quantitative tightening expectation, uh, raising rates expectations, a lot of analysts have been downgrading the earnings expectation uh, for the year 2023 itself. So it's only the matter that is the downgrade enough as of now or there will be more downgrades. So I would say that if uh, there is surprise to the downside in terms of earning, uh, in terms of uh, the earnings, uh, like uh, because of uh, the rates stay higher for longer or the terminal rate is not at 5.1%, instead it will shoot up to 6%, then I would say that it's uh, beyond 
a lot of analyst expectations and the earnings will drop some more, then the stocks will drop. Otherwise, if you tell me the playbook for this year is that Federal Reserve will stop their terminal rate at 5.1% and will start cutting the, the FOMC rate in the month of November 2023 this year, then I'll say that probably a lot of the things that we have been seeing now are mostly priced in. So this is why uh, in my playbook, I would say that uh, I personally are expecting the stocks will be bottoming in the first half of 2023 and will do better in the second half this year itself. So what are your thoughts about Warren Buffett other holdings like Apple, Bank of America, and American Express? Okay, again, it's a very good question. I like Apple a lot. Uh, I have covered Apple in my previous seminars. And I think uh, uh, Warren Buffett holding 46% of Apple in his Berkshire Hathaway's uh, portfolio is a very good holding itself. Um, the, the new growth factors for Apple is whether they will release the mixed reality headset in the first quarter of 2023 itself. Uh, in terms of Bank of America and American Express, um, I, I think I probably like the payment sector well or uh, better, like American Express or Visa or even MasterCard uh, itself. Okay. Okay, I think that would be all. There is no more questions. Okay, uh, again, thank you all for joining me tonight. And I hope to see you soon. Uh, Happy New Year and thank you.